This video footage is deceiving. What seems like a loving mother is actually a wolf in sheep's clothing. These videos of a terminally ill little girl having her final wishes granted hold a disturbing secret. A secret only her mother knows. This is the story of a mother's worst betrayal. She won our hearts as Bat Princess Olivia Gant living out her wish as a superhero on a Make-A-Wish Day in 2017. Now her mother is fighting charges that she faked her daughter's illness and murdered the girl when Olivia was seven years old. She opened her eyes and looked at me and recognized me and said, Papa, I'm hungry. She was hungry. Two days later, she died. A mother's love can be one of the most powerful forces in the world. Most mothers would give their own life to protect their child. The love between mother and child can be one of the strongest, most beautiful bonds. Even in the animal world, a mother can become a deadly force to be reckoned with if she feels her offspring is in danger. And I think that's what makes Olivia's story so horrific. She lived only seven short years, and every day she was on this earth, she was wrought with pain and suffering, all at the hands of her mother. Olivia's mother, Kelly Turner, medically tortured her since birth and played games with medical professionals. She was somehow able to convince doctors to perform unnecessary procedures on Olivia that eventually led to her death. Olivia Gant was born June 21st, 2010 in Pasadena, Texas, where she lived with her mother, Kelly Turner, her two sisters, and her father, John Gant. She left an indelible mark on those who knew her and was described by her grandfather, Lonnie Gatro, as a loving child. She just had a great imagination and loved playing with her dolls. Olivia's vibrant energy, caring nature, and zest for life made her a joy to be around. She was affectionately called Livy by her family, and she in turn referred to her grandfather as Papa. Olivia was absolutely adorable and never met a stranger. She should still be here, 
She would be 14 years old now, probably getting ready to start high school. The only consolation I find in her death is that she is no longer in pain at the hands of Kelly Turner. From the moment of Olivia's birth, Kelly would find things she thought were wrong with Olivia and bring those issues to her doctor's attention. In 2011, when Olivia was just a year old, Kelly started an online blog detailing Olivia's alleged medical issues to garner sympathy and support. The first page of the blog, Kelly called, quote-unquote, a little background. She talks about when Olivia's medical conditions started and describes in detail what they were. Let's read through some of this blog. It'll give us some insights into what was going on in Kelly's head and how this journey of deception and betrayal started. Olivia was born premature and was other than little healthy, or so we thought. At around nine month checkup, her pediatrician noticed that she was not developing mentally, physically, and that her head was growing off the chart. After a trip to the orthotics place and a referral to the neurologist, we thought we would simply get a helmet to reshape her skull and all would be well. Don't ever count your chickens before they hatch. MRI of the brain at the neuro office showed that Olivia had a vascular malformation of the brain. Further testing determined that it was inoperable. What came with that? Possibility of seizures, blindness, aneurysm, stroke, or death. It was decided that she would be monitored every few months. The next MRI led them to do an ultrasound because something in her neck looked different. So we now have discovered that there is a tumor on the parotid gland in her neck. What comes with that, you may wonder. Deafness in the right ear. Trouble swallowing. Trouble chewing. So in the course of from the time Olivia began seeing the doctor for specific things in her short life, we have now turned to, in June, have extended our diagnosis list and have been to several doctors before we found one actually able to test and treat Olivia. And we found them in Denver, Colorado. Okay, I have to interrupt reading her blog really quick and just explain a couple things before we move forward. If a physician or specialist did not agree with what Kelly thought was wrong with Olivia, she would do what's called doctor shop. Most doctor shoppers are going to different physicians in order to get prescriptions for controlled substances. But in Kelly's case, she was doctor shopping for physicians who would give her the diagnoses she was looking for. She apparently found some medical professionals in Colorado who might go along with her delusions, so she relocated to Littleton, Colorado with her daughters. Olivia's father, John Gant, couldn't leave his job in Texas, so he stayed behind. I couldn't find much information on John Gant or on the relationship between him and Kelly. News articles have stated they were married, and some have stated they had a tumultuous relationship. Let's get back to the blog. Olivia, at the age of two, is an autistic child with an inoperable vascular malformation, a tumor on the parotid gland, external hydrocephalus, too much water on the outside of the brain, developmental delay, L-carnitine deficiency, seizure disorder, and celiac disease. Fast forward and Olivia is now four and a half years old. She is just a ball full of energy and love. She is the strongest little girl I have ever met, although her sisters do put up a good fight as well. However, her diagnosis list is still pretty long. Olivia, at the age of four, has hydrocephalus seizure disorder, focal corticodysplasia, autism, intestinal dysmotility, loop ileostomy, vascular malformation in the brain, and a tumor on the parotid gland and developmental delays. On November 11th, the start of a very long journey began. After months of not being able to use the bathroom and being in extreme pain almost constantly, the great doctors decided that surgery to put in a colostomy was necessary. After the surgery, there has been ups and downs. On December 11th, Olivia was transported back to the hospital where Olivia had what is called intestinal prolapse. The on-call surgeon put her asleep enough to push the intestines back in. 
There were several discussions about operating, but Dr. Lamb has seen her the past few weeks and felt that in Olivia's best interest, she needed Dr. Beeler, who operated on her day one, to fix this. He said for her sake, consistency with the doctor is what was important. Okay, so here in her blog, she's actually admitting that a physician is telling her to keep it consistent and refer back to the original doctor as far as these medical decisions for Olivia. A side note, I still do not understand, I can't even comprehend how these unnecessary procedures were able to happen when we're dealing with a completely healthy child, but I digress. We'll go over more of that as the video goes on. We are in the beginning stages of forming a benefit to happen around June 2015. Please share, like, and follow so that we can get the word out and help this sweet little girl with all the hospital bills she is incurring. If you would like additional information or would like to donate, please comment below. This one blog post lists 11 medical issues Olivia had according to her mother. Now I'm not a doctor, but if you are anything like me, that blog post just doesn't sit right. She lists number one, vascular malformation of the brain. Number two, there is a tumor on the parotid gland in her neck. Number three, she's autistic. Number four, external hydrocephalus. Number five, L-carnitine deficiency. Number six, seizure disorder. Number seven, celiac disease. Number eight, cortical dysplasia. Number nine, intestinal dysmotility. Number 10, loop ileostomy. Number 11, developmental delays. According to an article in the Denver Post, some of Kelly's claims in her blog were absolutely nonsensical. For example, in one of her posts, he vented about doctors failing to note that the membrane in the corpus luteum in Olivia's brain was thinning. The corpus luteum is a structure in the ovary, not the brain. And side note, guys, I'm not a doctor. So if I mispronounce any of this medical terminology, please give me grace. I'm doing my best. Okay, moving on. That's just an example of the inconsistencies between Kelly recounting Olivia's health online versus what her actual medical records revealed. After the move to Colorado in 2012, there would be thousands of visits to Children's Hospital. In early visits, Kelly reported Olivia had a history of seizures and feeding difficulties, among other health issues. At some point, Olivia had been prescribed anti-seizure medication. It's not clear if that was prescribed by a doctor in Texas or Colorado, but in July of 2014, a neurologist in Colorado determined Olivia did not have seizures and advised Kelly to take her off the medication. Kelly would not follow the neurologist's instructions and kept administering the anti-seizure medication to Olivia. To address Kelly's complaints about Olivia's feeding issues, doctors first referred Olivia to therapy for picky eating, but Kelly insisted the problem was ongoing and that Olivia was also struggling with severe constipation. It's unclear how many visits and complaints from Kelly it took to get to this point, but in November of 2014, Olivia undergoes an ileostomy, which creates a hole in the abdomen so that waste can drain directly from the small intestine to a bag. Her constipation improves, but Kelly reports she won't eat and a feeding tube is put in through her nose. In January of 2015, a more permanent feeding tube is inserted through Olivia's abdomen, replacing the temporary tube in her nose. A different type of tube will be placed surgically shortly afterward. In June of 2015, Olivia has another surgery to place a tube to feed her through her veins, a process called total parenteral nutrition, or TPN. She undergoes feeding therapy at the hospital and improves her ability to eat normal foods. In July of 2015, Kelly first posts online that Olivia has a terminal illness. Her medical records show no such disease. 
In 2016, Olivia receives escalating doses of painkillers. Sometime in 2017, Kelly reaches out to the Make-A-Wish Foundation, telling them Olivia is terminally ill and lists her final wishes. In February of 2017, the foundation hosts a bat princess party for Olivia. Olivia was also able to do a ride along with the police department and the fire department hosted an event for her as well. In March of 2017, Olivia undergoes her final surgery, a procedure implanting a tube in her bladder, which drains through her abdomen. March 24 of 2017, Kelly requests that Olivia not be resuscitated if her heart stops or given naloxone if her breathing stops because of the large doses of opioids she is receiving. March 27th through 28th, 2017, Olivia's care team raises concern that the amount of stool in Olivia's ostomy bag and the amount recorded in her chart don't add up. This is important because the amount of stool is a clue to how well Olivia's intestines are functioning. A monitor is assigned to the room and the amount of stool improves significantly. Doctors aren't sure if she improved on her own, the medicine they gave helped, or if the monitor prevented tampering. March 29, 2017, Turner requests that Olivia be placed in hospice. July 11, 2017, a doctor refuses to renew an order not to resuscitate Olivia if her heart stops or give her naloxone if she overdoses on prescribed opioids, precipitating a series of ethics meetings. The hospital's child protection team finds, quote unquote, no reason to alert the Department of Human Services to potential medical CA. This is according to Olivia's medical records. A different doctor later signs the order. August 1st, 2017. Olivia is transferred to hospice. She was happy to leave the hospital. She was happy to have all the tubes removed and sang songs on the way, feeling free for just a brief moment. Olivia had no idea she was being sent to her death. When she arrives, they settle her in. She receives pain medication. And for 19 days, she starved. For 19 days, Kelly Turner sat there and watched Olivia suffer, watched her dying, knowing all of this was completely unnecessary. It was the result of years of her lies and manipulations. August 20th, 2017, Olivia dies. She was buried at Seven Stones Chatfield Cemetery in Littleton, Colorado. Here are some excerpts from Olivia's obituary. Sunday, August 20th, we lost our little princess, Olivia, after a long battle to a rare disease at the age of seven. Olivia was with us a very short time, but through her short life and big battles, she taught us that we can be joyful in all things. After many operations and numerous stays in the hospital, Olivia always came home with a smile. She would be overjoyed to see her big sisters and ready to play with them immediately. She became known as the princess after always wearing her princess dresses while in the hospital. No hospital gowns for Olivia. Through her many stays in Children's Hospital, Colorado, most people there loved and cherished the princess. She loved school and was able to attend pre-K kindergarten and part of first grade at Columbine Hills Elementary before her health began to decline more rapidly. That was the highlight of her life, being at school with her teachers and friends. At home, Olivia loved playing with her sisters, being on her iPad, or watching her DVDs. She had an unbelievable imagination that would entertain herself and others for hours. Her mouth never stopped, but would give others such joy and laughter.
When she was able, her favorite places to visit were Dairy Queen, the Zoo, and Dinosaur Ridge. She loved vanilla ice cream cones, lions, and could tell you almost anything about dinosaurs and sharks. It was only the last month that playing and talking began to cease. Our precious little princess will now have a new body, no tubes, no more pain or sickness, and everlasting joy with our Lord. See you in heaven, our precious Olivia, you and your hero with our Lord. Not much is known about Kelly Turner's life outside of Olivia's tragedy, but she did have a criminal record in Texas. Her past criminal record sheds some light on what kind of person she was. The forgery charge makes sense, being that Olivia's tragedy is rooted in her defrauding everyone ever involved with Olivia. Impersonation of a medical technician seems to show some sick fascination with the medical field. Last, but definitely not least, she was charged with felony S.A. with bodily injury on a child. My God, I read that and was horrified she ended up having three children of her own. Her criminal history paints a picture of subhuman trash in my book. She was already hurting children before she even had her own. And this was Olivia's mother. Not much else needs to be said about her. My heart just breaks for this innocent baby girl who never stood a chance. Fast forward to October of 2018. Kelly brings Olivia's sister to a new primary care physician, Dr. Courtney Santucci, after her original primary care physician had retired. She expressed concerns her daughter was having bone pain. Kelly told the physician that she was previously treated for lymphoma in Texas and stated she had cancer. Dr. Santucci noticed Olivia's sister did not have any scars associated with cancer treatment and contacted the family's former physicians in Texas. She found out that she had never been diagnosed or treated for cancer. The doctor reported her findings, which led to a CA case being filed with the state and an investigation began. Because of Olivia's untimely death, the investigation into CA on her sister sparked Colorado Children's Hospital's Child Protection Team to be notified. The team alerted the Department of Human Services with concerns about Kelly Turner medically harming Olivia and her surviving sister. Within days, authorities interviewed Olivia's sister at school and told Kelly she had to move out of the family's home, separating her from Olivia's surviving sisters pending further investigation. During the investigation, it was found that some doctors and nurses at Children's Hospital Colorado had raised concerns that Olivia was being medically harmed by her mother weeks before she died but none of them reported their suspicions despite the state's mandated reporting laws. Instead, the hospital investigated those concerns internally through its own child protection team and had a series of ethics meetings. They relied in part on false information provided by Olivia's mother. They concluded there was no reason to alert the outside authorities to potential CA. It's been reported that a 2016 hospital written policy instructs its medical providers to submit concerns of CA to the hospital's internal child protection team, which then decides if outside authorities should be alerted. That seems like an authoritarian way to protect the hospital's interests, not the children's. Just my opinion. The investigation also revealed how Children's Hospital Colorado, known to be a leader in recognizing CA, discounted doctors and nurses' concerns and missed potential warning signs. Olivia's medical records didn't clearly show how doctors determined her intestines were failing, which led to the invasive ileostomy procedure. A month before intestinal failure was listed on Olivia's medical records, 
Staff documented her eating small amounts of food with no apparent problems and maintaining a stable weight. After the ileostomy procedure, providers at the hospital noticed discrepancies between how much discharge they saw in Olivia's stoma bag and how much was recorded in her medical records. The discharge was an important indicator of how well her intestines were working, and when Olivia's caregivers reported the discrepancies, Dr. Deborah Nygut ordered her to be monitored one-on-one for 24 hours. This decision made Kelly very upset, and she protested the decision, stating they were trying to punish her and thought she was being a bad mother. During the investigation, a nurse's aide spoke of Kelly often becoming indignant, taking concerns to supervising nurses, or calling doctors directly. It was also revealed that Olivia became somewhat of a poster child for the hospital due to her frequent stays. She was pictured in brochures, featured in fundraisers, and the nurse's aide stated the staff would jump through hoops for Kelly because Olivia was so public and Kelly had them in a vice grip. The hospital went through with 24-hour monitoring and noted the stoma bag output dramatically improved and increased to a normal range. The timing of the improvement raised concerns according to notes written by Dr. Nygut. At a later hospital stay, Kelly urged the doctor on overnight duty to double Olivia's dose of opioid medication. The doctor pushed back and stated the dose she was requesting could knock a child unconscious and stop their breathing. He declined to increase the dosage. I was able to gather some video footage from physicians and hospital staff interviewing with law enforcement that I'd like to play for you now. I feel like it gives insight as to what the physicians and hospital staff were dealing with and what they were thinking. I will say though, there's a lot of excuses in these videos and by the time I was done watching them, I was quite infuriated. You'll have to let me know what you guys think, but I definitely think we need to watch these. It's gonna help us understand what they were thinking when they were dealing with Olivia and her mother, Kelly. Here is an interview with the floor manager of the hospital when Olivia was there talking about Olivia's opioid use and how they were trying to lower the dosage. It's a very interesting interview. Was that when he came in, um, it appeared that he had a lot of sedating type medications and we had been slowly withdrawing some of those medications. We were still giving some of them, but um, at decreased doses. And as we did that, and it was perking back up and was awake and talking to people and we're, was interactive with people um, and seemed you know, to kind of go back to the patient that we knew or were familiar with, I guess. Um, and at that point, I believe Kelly wanted to continue with the hospice care and wanted to start withdrawing other care, such as feedings and things like that. And um, when that happened, some of my nursing staff came to me and they were somewhat upset with that decision. Um, they didn't feel that that seemed appropriate based off of where it currently was. I mean, at that point, she was asking, she was asking, she got to go home. She definitely, I think, more interactive and more engaging. And um, they came to me and were concerned with that. Ethics did come in and explain, you know, based off of um, her diagnosis, based off the symptoms that we feel like she's experiencing at home, from information that we had gathered from Kelly, that this was appropriate, that it meant a definition of um, being something that would be life-ending. And so 
based off of the information that they had. That's why they were supporting um, that decision. Most parents are really invested in us doing everything possible for their kids, sometimes even beyond the point that it's not going to be beneficial anymore and it's not going to be helpful. And even when you try to convince, you know, to say, if you really want this, we'll do this, but it's not like going to change the outcome. It's not sure. going to, I mean, they are so invested in prolonging their child's life and doing everything possible, um, you know, to be hopeful and to think, you know, if we hang on a little bit longer, there might be a new med, a new, you know, sure. like, that's kind of what most parents are going yeah. for. I mean, and I never got that feeling from Kelly. Um, we did have a meeting with them and she did express, um, you know, extreme discomfort that she really did not feel that Kelly was making the appropriate decision. And um, what the CAP team asked us, they said for us to be able to report it, like, like what is... Like, is, like, we can't report a feeling, I think, was basically their response. Like, what evidence do you have of that? Has Kelly said anything to you? Has Kelly said anything? As, like, they asked a lot of questions as far as kind of, like, we need to have some type of, I don't know if evidence is a good way to put, but it's, it's kind of that. Like, we have to have something to support while we are reporting, or we can't report. Um, and I think she just, like, we couldn't come up with concrete examples or evidence, I guess is the thing, other than this doesn't feel right, this is not like it normally is for other kids, this, like, we're just not positive we believe yeah. Kelly anymore. Um, and... CAP team was kind of like, well, we have to have more than that. I didn't believe her because there were discrepancies that just didn't quite make sense. And in medicine, the tests are not perfect. We have stuff like this all the time that you're like, well, really? Maybe we should repeat that test because it doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. But it was just one after another after another, right? You know, when you ask for the small bowel, the small bowel transit looks amazing. And, you know, this, there's a stool coming out of every orifice. Nobody sees that to the hospital several times and nobody notes that or writes that down, right? And of course the dev note. And then I see that, that there's more and more uh, and she's oh no no we're using it very sparingly. And I can see that is you know with dark glasses playing in her computer not the same that was playing with me, right? Yeah. I mean Monday morning quarterback right at the time in fact just in the hospital, you just had surgery, right? Yeah. So there's always a feasible or possible explanation. Pain, we have no test for pain, right? So the mother said, she's in terrible pain, and then I even said, it looks pretty good. Oh, it's a good day. But then I th 30 doctors might have taken care of this kid or more. Yes. And somehow, right, yeah. she navigated these waters. Well, I, I have to say, I think that this is, this is the perfect diagnosis to lie. Why do you say that? Because our tests for motility are far from perfect, right? And motility testing is already compromised by a child that has a lot of surgery and narcotics, and, right? So now you don't even know if it's cause or effect, right? Yeah. It's very hard to make a diagnosis, the plumbing part of it. For pain, we have nothing, right? Nothing. You just have to take somebody's word for it. Um, so. Uh, it's very easy. It's very easy to lie. And if you read Rob's first notes for a long time, he's constipated. Yeah. Like a million other kids. It's chronic constipation, mostly from probably withholding. Yeah. That's all. And, and then it escalates and it escalates and it escalates. And this medical system that is so divided with so many specialists now that you, you will have 30 people involved, right? And we're not having medical meetings all in one room. I don't know half the doctors that have taken care of yeah. Right? It's just the size. Yeah. 
So, of, of course we're not in communication. We, the he says, she says, so easy. Okay. If, the, if she says, oh, the surgeon said this, unfortunately I'm probably not going to take the time to call the surgeon and say, did you really say that? Because we just, we, just, we just can't or we don't. I mean, unless we suspect. I think we didn't detect it in time. Heroic doses of narcotics. Heroic doses. Um, though you sneak up on that, right? You know, yeah. So, although that, none of us would survive, I don't think, the doses that she was receiving for, yeah. um, even if we split them, okay, yeah. between the three of us. Yeah. Uh, um, but, um, but that was a, a scenario where, where, where I was really taken aback and I'm saying, well, all right, well, this girl stood up on the gurney and gave me a hug, if I remember correctly, in the ER at the time of the mission. And, and, and I'm saying, okay, well, where does the DNR come from and, and who, who does not have a quality of life and, and all of this piece. And, and, uh, and I had frank conversations with mom that went kind of shockingly well. Um, I think palliative care was, was there with this when I had to tell her that I'm, I'm not comfortable with this. I cannot sign this DNR. And, and I told her, I can't trust you to tell me that she has no quality of life, all right? And, and, uh, and I think I probably said, uh, it doesn't matter who you are, you know, uh, I'm not going to trust you to be the only voice for this, uh, and tell me that, uh, that she, doesn't, uh, she doesn't deserve everything that we would offer for another child here. Um, and we also talked about, well, what do you do in this scenario? Okay, and, uh, and there were some meetings, and I called an ethics uh, consult, um, and, uh, 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 and, and had meetings with uh, palliative care, and then eventually with a colleague who um, uh, took over her care, because I, I, I just wasn't comfortable with that scenario. And, and in those conversations, we talked about, well, what do you do with this, right? You know, where, where you don't know. And, 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 and I was clear about, all right, I don't know. Uh, intestinal failure has dysmotility or not. Um, and there is no test I could do to do that other than to challenge this. And we had conversations that I don't even remember who, who was involved in which ones, but uh, about, well, okay, you hospitalize her. Well, if you hospitalize and and a parent, Kelly or otherwise, is in that room at all, okay, well, that's not going to be a very good test, right? So what, do you remove your mom and do you put another placement? Um, and, uh, and wow, that's an enormous step. I think the last admission, there was uh, close to, despite the many, <laughs> the many hours that day, um, the, uh, there really was no, um, substantial discussion about, about signs or symptoms there. It okay. was, it was really all about, okay, we have a DNR, this is a horrible situation in my mind, and, um, I don't think we should have a DNR, and I can't find anyone who tell, who could tell me why we should have a DNR, um, and I sought out people who and that was the focus of the last admission. And, and in the end, uh, you know, I remain very, very uncomfortable with the situation and care. I mean, I've never been in a situation where I refuse somebody's care. I've never heard of that before. Um, uh, um, Say mom has the kid's best interest in heart. And we've done what we can, medically speaking, and we will respect the wishes to transfer to hospice and withdraw care. Or we call DHS and pursue much other diagnosis. And that, as I'm sure you guys know, is a significant uphill battle without wonderful documentation. And, um, and no one felt like that was, you know, they're never cut and dried, but no one felt it fit the right picture for that. You know, people that knew her... Mom was a little quirky. She might have had a bipolar or personality type disorder, but that doesn't mean that she doesn't have best interest in heart. So we couldn't base our decision on, on a perceived mental health diagnosis that she may or may not have. 
Um, I guess in hindsight, we maybe made the wrong choice. Um, but at the time, everybody I talked to, including our ethics team, um, including our GI service, we all felt that we, we didn't really have this. What I mean, th this was the right decision. You know, that it, it was our decision to to allow her to pursue this, and that she had interests at heart were were in alignment with proper medical um, care. And I think we all kind of begrudgingly agreed that we had to respect that. And and we let it happen. I even went and saw her hospice. And um, Kelly was appropriate. She was distraught, but, but at peace with her decision. I don't know that we would have done anything different put in that situation. Obviously, hindsight 2020. But again, you know, as much as I can be off the record, I feel absolutely terrible about this. And you know, it's it's the what if, what what could we have done differently? How could we have seen this coming? What could we have done? Could we have prevented this? Could we have gotten obviously someone involved earlier, maybe? And you know, well, I, I guess basically we we call we call child protective services, and and they take it from there. And um, for what it's worth, um, I, I mean, I have a social worker on my team. We, we, we definitely have times when we call them. It is not to fault the system. It's very hit or miss. Uh, I've seen, I've had families in Stapleton have their kids taken away because they're playing in the park across the street. I've had kids of meth addicts who the report was filed three times and nothing happened. So I, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, not the, it's not a perfect system and it means no system is. But it's a really... That's a really tough thing to do because what I'm basically saying, if I'm going to say we're going to we're going to go down Munchausen's route, I'm saying you're you're not parenting your child correctly. Not only that, but you are putting them in harm's way. We're taking your child away, and and investigating them because if you know if we do open a, D, a, a, a CPS case, um, they're the first thing they're going to do is is that investigation and. We've got to have documentation in place, you know, and if I just started now, it's the day one of where you want to do this, um, I better have great records going back a long time. I better have a lot of places where I said this doesn't feel right. There's, a, you know, there's a split between medical and, and, and what mom's saying. And I don't know that any of us had that enough to really push for it. And again, it's one of those diagnoses that you better be sure. You better be sure you're doing that. You can't just be like, well, yeah, maybe. If we're going to pull that trigger, sorry to use an no, okay. inappropriate term, you know what I mean, though, right? Yeah. You pull the trigger, the trigger's pulled. Yeah. You know, you do that, and we're saying you're an unfit mother. You're doing something wrong, right? Again, hindsight 2020, clearly, maybe we should have said something or looked into it further. I, knowing what I know now, obviously, a different story. Knowing what I knew then, we would have done the same thing 100% of the time. Um, you know, I, it is so, it's so tough to think that, that a parent doesn't have their child the best interest in mind. Um, it's so difficult to assume that that they're that they are they're lying to me that they're fabricating you know and and again this is this is probably the 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 presumptuous optimism of a physician you know I, I, I assume you know I, I'm, I'm on the people are good side of things that being said I see the underbelly all the time yeah you know, you know where I'm coming from. It's there, and I know I see it. But I, I, we, we as a medical community, when people come to us for help, we assume they really need help, and 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 it's it's. I, I don't know what it looks like personally. I have not made that phone call. Um, we have had patients historically who have ended up getting that diagnosis. Um, the occasional patient that I worry about, I dot my T's and I cross my I's and I make sure my documentation is pristine so that if it does come up, and this was one of those where I, you know, I hope that I documented everything perfectly that, uh, that, that, cause I don't know where the fine tooth comb. I just, 
yeah, again, doing it all over again, I don't know that I would have done anything differently. Um, is this going to change my practice in the future? Am I going to start going on social media? I don't know that I want to do yeah, that. Well, I, don't, but... I don't know that we're encouraging that. And just, <laughs> just to be crystal clear, uh, we're not approaching this investigation at all from the perspective that there was any nefarious intent on the part of anybody yeah. at Children's. I know, I know, I understand that. I just, I just feel awful about it. I mean, it's, you know, I... <laughs> After Olivia was released from this hospital stay, Kelly moved Olivia to home hospice care and Olivia received higher doses of narcotics while she was being cared for at home. Three months later, Olivia returned to Children's Hospital for an infection related to the tubes in her body. It was during this stay more providers began raising the alarm about potential CA. Doctors pointed to the possibility that Olivia's reported pain was opioid-induced hyperalgesia, a condition where a patient's nerves become more sensitive to pain after taking opioids. Dr. Seth Eisendorfer noted that Olivia would scream in pain about 20 minutes after receiving hydromorphone. During this time, Kelly had requested a do not resuscitate order. She justified her request by saying that if Olivia dies while we're rotating opioids, it's God's time to call her home, and I am not going to stop that. I will not watch my child die while you guys are pounding on her chest or sticking a tube down her throat. Dr. Thomas Walker, a pediatric gastroenterologist, put his concerns into medical records writing that the care the hospital was providing might be making Olivia's condition worse. He objected to the DNR and refused to sign it. He requested the hospital's ethics committee weigh in on the situation, sparking the first of three meetings. Some of Olivia's medical providers expressed significant concerns about Kelly's ability to make decisions in Olivia's best interest. The committee ultimately sided with Kelly. Olivia's father was also contacted by phone, and records show he supported the DNR as well. The committee transferred Olivia's care from Dr. Walker to another physician who was willing to sign the Do Not Resuscitate order. Kelly also wanted to stop Olivia's TPN, the tube sending all of her nutrition through her veins. She stated that Olivia's body was rejecting the TPN, which isn't possible. Her medical records did not show any concerns with the TPN. Removing it would kill Olivia. There was another ethics meeting to discuss Kelly's request to remove the TPN. Kelly was so upset by the hearing and the concerns of medical professionals in the meeting she walked out stating she felt it was selfish to prolong Olivia's life. She stated specifically, I know there is a better life for Olivia in heaven. I'm more afraid of her suffering than I am of her dying. I hate to see her suffer every day. You've got to be kidding me. The ethics committee sided with Kelly again and allowed the removal of the TPN which would kill Olivia, and had her transferred to hospice to die. Medical providers who objected could follow the hospital's conscientious objector policy and file a report with the hospital's internal social worker or child protection team to be referred to outside social services. If none of them did, then Olivia would be transferred to the Denver hospice. None of them did. When Dr. Jillian Cotter signed the papers discharging Olivia to hospice, she noted that she personally disagreed with Kelly's decision, but thought that the hospital did its due diligence to ensure Kelly had the capacity to decide and wasn't breaking any laws. Dr. Jillian Cotter signed Olivia's death warrant. 
As I mentioned before, Olivia was told she was going to a place with no more owies. She was excited and watched the Lion King on the bus ride from Children's Hospital to Hospice. She sang Hakuna Matata on the way. And the ends of the worries for the rest of your days. She didn't know she was going to die. She was happy. Investigators eventually decided to exhume Olivia's body for further examination. Her death had originally been listed as complications due to intestinal failure. The autopsy law enforcement requested after the exhumation ruled her cause of death as undetermined. After about a year-long investigation, Friday, October 18th, 2019, Kelly was arrested and charged with 13 criminal offenses, two counts of murder in the first degree, one count of CA, three counts of theft, three counts of charitable fraud, two counts of attempt to influence a public servant, and two counts of second degree forgery. A few weeks before her trial was set to begin, she accepted a plea deal to an amended charge of CA negligently causing death. She also pleaded guilty to theft of $100,000 to $1 million and to charitable fraud. She was sentenced to 16 years in prison. Olivia's grandfather, Lonnie Gatro, has taken significant steps to seek justice and accountability for her murder. He believes that mandatory reporting laws, which require health care to report abuse, were not followed by the hospital that treated Olivia. He is calling for a change in policies regarding the reporting of suspected CA. He filed a $25 million lawsuit against the hospital that was eventually settled for an undisclosed amount. Daughter. So first one is Cinderella. Cute as a button? She going to make... No. Cuter. So much cuter. Olivia Gant exuded joy. Cool. Look at all those details. Even as a system designed to protect her failed. It rips your heart out. You know, she could still be with us. You know, she did not have to die. It plays over and over in my mind. She, she didn't know she was going there to die. Lonnie Gotro was Olivia's step-grandfather. A frequent one-man audience to Olivia's one-kid show. See, wow, Cinderella, you're so different. Oh, no, the elephant failed, the elephant failed. Yeah, get the elephant. He can watch these videos over and over. And the ends of the world is for the rest of your days. Not this one, though. Not knowing what he knows now. They put a child in hospice to starve to death. As far as I'm concerned, that's how she dies. She starved to death. So TPN is total parenteral nutrition. So it's essentially IV nutrition. University of Chicago pediatric medical ethicist, Dr. K. Sarah Hohen says what mom wanted was clear. Stopping TPN in someone who is TPN dependent is going to lead to certain death within weeks. This is not someone who's in tremendous distress. This is not someone who's in pain. And yet that day, one doctor at Children's concluded he was comfortable discharging Olivia to hospice, where TPN would be discontinued. And the ends of the world is for the rest of your days. As Olivia sang on her way to hospice, a hospice nurse noted, she is unaware that stopping nutrition will assuredly cause her demise. And I think when that many people are uncomfortable, that needs to be something where someone says, okay, we're gonna stop, we're gonna pause, let's go to another hospital, get another opinion. But Dr. Hohen says that pause could have exposed children to criticism for all of the surgeries and for all of the times its staff had treated Olivia. I mean, I think there's an potential for a conflict of interest when you have someone who's literally been the poster child for that hospital for a long period of time and now saying, gosh, we're not sure, we're missing something. Two days before Olivia died, Lonnie Gotro, unaware of the internal hospital debate, sat with his dying granddaughter. And I grabbed her little hand and she opened her eyes 
and being on all his heavy narcotics, she recognized me and said, Papa, I'm hungry. And all the signs were there for them to protect her and to report abuse and save her life. Instead, they put her on a deathbed. Researching Olivia's case had me crawling out of my skin. Reporting the details of it is one thing, but reading through the unnecessary medical procedures she was forced to endure while her mother looked on brought on this fury inside of me. Reading how Olivia would scream and thrash around, knowing a surgery was imminent. Then she fights to have Olivia transferred to hospice and watches her starve for 19 days. How? How twisted do you have to be as a mother to watch your child suffer for years because of a facade you have created? Collecting money off of your child's suffering. My God, I am so heartbroken and infuriated. There have been headlines saying Kelly suffered with Munchausen by proxy, of which, by the way, she herself denies. I purposely did not mention that until now because I firmly believe the only labels fitting for this woman is evil, soulless, devoid of human emotion, and many other labels I cannot say on this platform. And then to think... After Olivia was gone, Kelly tried to do it again with her surviving sister. Thank goodness Dr. Santucci did the right thing and actually followed up on Kelly's claims her daughter had cancer and actually did something about it. She literally saved that child's life. Then there's the good old plea deal. 16 years. Are you kidding me? We all know she won't serve her entire sentence. In my opinion, this woman should have to endure seven years of torture, then sent to her death, just like she did to Olivia. Everything about Olivia's case seems so unjust. The only thing that maybe gives me a little tiny bit of peace is that Olivia is no longer in pain. She never had to know how horrifically her mother betrayed her. Rest in love, sweet Olivia. You will never be forgotten. <laughs>